lost in the Amazon rainforest, without any supplies in the Sahara Desert, feeling the chill out in the frigid Arctic? I'm sure you've got plenty of ideas of how to take care of yourself, right? Well, forget them. They're probably completely wrong. In fact, they're more likely to leave you as a pile of bones in a ditch somewhere. So from peeing on a jellyfish sting to drinking that pee to stay hydrated, here are some survival myths that could get you killed and what you should really do to survive. Frostbite First Aid If you ever find yourself stuck outside in a cold climate, one of the biggest risks to your safety is frostbite. You've probably heard of it, but what exactly is it? Well, it's when a person's skin and the tissue underneath winds up freezing. It'll start out like a painful red patch, but if left untreated, will progress and your skin will stiffen, numb, and go a sickly gray. In the very worst cases, it can even lead to tissue necrosis, which is where your skin literally dies. Ew. So if you've gotten cold enough to catch frostbite, you'll want to warm up, pronto. Now, if your hands are a little cold, you rub them together, right? Despite your first instinct though, never rub anywhere you suspect might be catching frostbite. This will only make things worse, a lot worse. Yeah, rubbing frostbite skin will just cause more tissue damage. It needs to be treated gently and given the chance to heal. Okay, so if we have the tools, how about starting a nice warm fire instead? Nope, frostbitten skin is super sensitive and could easily be burnt by open flames. Damn, so what can you do? Well, the best approach is to submerge any affected areas in warm water and drink warm liquids, not hot. This will warm you up gently and avoid burns. But if you're still out in the cold, your priority should really be finding some shelter. Otherwise, no matter what you do, your skin will just refreeze anyway. Preferably, that shelter will be somewhere with Netflix and room service. Cactus Cocktails Okay, let's say you're in the desert and you're desperately hot. Dehydration is setting in and you need some water fast. You may have seen some old Western movies where the cowboy chops open a cactus and takes a drink from inside. Don't try this. It's not actually water inside the prickly plant. It's a noxious fluid that'll cause vomiting, diarrhea, and stomach pain. If you're already dehydrated, the last thing you need is to be losing precious water by puking and pooping it all up. If you're very unlucky, the forbidden smoothie could even cause paralysis. Oh man. There is a single exception to this rule. The fish hook barrel cactus's juices can be ingested, though only in tiny quantities and only ever in an extreme emergency. This cactus is less likely to cause those unpleasant side effects, but it's still not worth the risk. A better option is the fruit of a cactus named the prickly pear. It's full of water and can be safely ingested, providing you remove all those spines. Unlike cactus goop, this cactus fruit is unlikely to lead to a weekend atop the porcelain throne, so the choice should be obvious. If you'd like some primo entertainment to watch while sat on your own porcelain throne, look no further. Hit those like and subscribe buttons to make sure you never miss another great video like this one. It could save your life. Don't believe this. Anybody that's ever disturbed a nest of bees will know how terrifying the experience can be. I just wanted a little honey. Bees and wasps are relentless, and if they see you as a threat, then they'll make sure you know it. Dealing with one isn't much of a problem, but trying to swat a whole swarm? Good luck with that. The only thing to do is run and try and find somewhere safe to hide. Whatever you do though, if you see a pond or river, don't jump into it. Anonymous fraudsters claiming to be survival experts are adamant that because neither bees nor wasps like water, jumping into a lake or river and hiding beneath the surface will make them give up and buzz off. In reality, that's not the case at all. These stripy stingers are aggressive and super protective of their homes. If you've angered them, why would the short time you can hold your breath for be enough to dissuade them? They'll simply wait above the water for you. Okay, waiting for you is a bit dramatic, they won't literally hover and watch the spot where you went under, but they'll continue to search the area for you until you inevitably have to resurface. And when you do, it'll be beat down time once again. Only you'll have the added disadvantage of, you know, being in water. 
So if you're ever chased by wasps or bees, stay on dry land and try and find shelter. Better yet, don't annoy them enough to chase you. Fire before shelter? You know how in movies you always get those scenes of people lost in the wilderness sleeping around a huge fire? It makes for a nice looking scene, sure, but in the real world, a fire shouldn't be anyone's priority. Shelter is much more important. For one, all it'll take is a spot of rain or some strong winds, and then that fire you put so much effort into is kaput. Plus, fires need fueling and maintaining with wood, which will use a lot of your precious energy. Shelter, on the other hand, is effective from the moment it's set up and provides a safe place to sleep when you eventually collapse from exhaustion. And trust me, you will. But what exactly should you be looking to build? Well, you need some form of bed above all else. I'm not saying you need a king-size mattress and a heated blanket. You just need to make sure you're off the ground. It gets very, very cold at night and you could easily freeze if you're lying on it without protection. A simple makeshift mattress can be built by laying long branches out on the floor then insulating your creation with lots of leaves or grass. If you've got any tools to hand, you could even attach branches together and suspend your bed between two trees like a true survivalist. Only once you've got a place to sleep should you focus on anything else, like a roof. And after the roof, then you can try and get around to that swimming pool you've always dreamed of. The quicksand question. Growing up, I thought that quicksand would be a much bigger threat in my life than it actually ended up being. Thanks, Andy. Outside of the movies, it's unlikely to swallow you in seconds if you accidentally touch it with your little toe. However, it can still trap you if you're not careful, which could be extremely dangerous if you don't know how to react. But what actually is it? Essentially, quicksand is loose sand or grit that's become so saturated with water that it behaves more like a liquid than a solid and can no longer hold weight very well. So here's the big question. If you get caught in it, do you think you should stay still or try to free yourself? I'm waiting. Okay, if you said stay still, wrong. Pop culture has taught us that the best thing to do is avoid struggling and wait for someone to reach out with a handy stick. Outside of Tinseltown though, this just isn't good advice. If you stay motionless, you'll never get free, especially if you don't have a friend with you to dramatically save you. That being said, don't flail around like a maniac either. What you should do is lean backwards to distribute your weight evenly and make slow back and forth movements with your body to loosen the sticky sand's hold on you. It'll take a fair while, but it'll get you out of there alive eventually. Human see, human don't. If you're lost out in the wilderness and your tummy starts a rumbling, it could be very difficult to figure out what you can and can't eat. Choose correctly and your chances of surviving increase significantly but choose incorrectly and you could be in for a really bad time. So how do we tell? If you said, take a look at what other animals are eating and copy them, then congratulations, you aren't surviving. Yep, there's a common belief that if you see an animal eating something, it's safe for human consumption too. This should set off alarm bells for any sensible person. Humans and animals have completely different diets. Chocolate is deadly to a dog while it's my favorite treat. So any berries or plants that you might see a deer or bird chowing down on could be lethal to you. There is a definitive method to find out if something is safe to eat, however, the universal edibility test. In simple terms, it involves taking the plant or berry in question and gradually exposing your body to it to check for adverse reactions. First, you check if it smells okay. Pear or almond are sense to avoid as they could be a sign of cyanide. Then you rub it on the inside of your elbow and wait 15 minutes. If it itches or hurts, throw the plant away. If not, pop a small part of it in your mouth and chew it for a few minutes. You're looking for bitterness, soapiness, or general tingliness and pain. If you get any of those, spit it out. If not, eat a little bit and wait eight hours. Yes, eight hours. But if you wanna be sure it's safe, you're gonna have to be patient. If, finally, after that, there are no side effects, you can eat the plant, or at least the part of it you tested. Just because you can eat the leaf doesn't mean you can eat the stem. Jeez, that sounds exhausting, right? But it's better to be exhausted than dead. Boiling bad. Food is important, but it's actually possible to survive for months without it. Water, however, 
After just three days, you'll be sleeping with the fishes, who incidentally are plenty hydrated, so you'll want to find yourself some sweet H2O. You should prioritize running water as it's less likely to be home to a load of critters than stagnant water. Unfortunately, even then, most water you come across in the wild will be undrinkable. It's unclean and full of bacteria. As well as catching diseases from it, it can also cause diarrhea, which ironically will make you lose more water than you gain. So what should you do? Well, it's fairly common knowledge that boiling dirty water can remove impurities and make it safe to drink. In an extreme scenario, however, you aren't likely to have a kettle and a power outlet to hand. You'll have to start a fire and boil your water in any container that you can rustle up. Here's the catch, though. Although boiling will kill harmful bacteria, it won't remove any dangerous chemicals or sediments that are lurking in there. So it still might not be enough to save you. You should actually filter the water before boiling it wherever possible. The best way to filter is to cover a container with a shirt or cloth and then place some crushed charcoal from your fire on top. Pour the water through the cloth into the container and the charcoal will catch nasty contaminants while improving the taste as a little bonus. Sounds weird, but don't knock it till you've tried it. Before even that though, try and find the source of the water you're looking to drink. If you find that there's a bunch of dead rats in it or something, it may be best to look elsewhere unless you enjoy that delicious rat-like zest. Following Wing We've already established just how important water is for you. I mean, us humans. <clears throat> Seeking out a good source of water is a priority in any survival situation, but what's the best way to do it? Enter our next myth. Many claim that you can locate a water source by simply following birds in flight. The logic is that the airborne avians will be traveling to water themselves, so all you need to do is tag along and they'll lead you to it. And while some aquatic birds rarely leave the water's edge, others fly all over the place for a wide variety of reasons. For all you know, those birds could be migrating to foreign lands or flying home to bed. So instead of looking up, keep an eye out for animals on the ground. They'll regularly travel to water and won't wander nearly as far as our feathered friends. It takes a keen eye and some patience, but as long as you don't spook every animal in the area with your rendition of, I'm a survivor, it should pay off. A jellyfish joke. Jellyfish suck. Their long flowing tentacles get nasty stings that cause searing pain, may leave barbs full of venom stuck inside you, and can even be fatal. But what if you do get stung? Well, I can tell you what not to do, Somewhere, somehow, a rumor emerged that taking a whiz on a jellyfish sting would help with the immense pain. What? I wish I was kidding. Now, I'm not so sorry to break it to you, but this simply doesn't work. Taking a leak on a sting can actually cause stinging cells to release even more venom and make the pain worse, not better. See, the whole reason this crazy myth even came into being was because people thought the ammonia in our urine could neutralize the venom of the sting. In reality, it does nothing at all and can in fact activate the stinging cells. But why? Well, jellyfish live in the sea, which is composed of salt water. If the stinging cells are exposed to any change in the balance of salty solution they're used to, they're set off. Urine does not have the same salt content as salt water, or at least it shouldn't, so it activates the stingers and makes the pain worse. The same goes for fresh water. Experts agree that the correct thing to do is remove any barbs in the affected area and then wash it thoroughly with salt water. Long story short, peeing on either yourself or your stung pal won't provide any pain relief. Try saying that three times fast. Beat the heat. When you're on vacation, showing some skin can be a good way of building a nice tan and staying a little cooler. But if you're stranded in an oppressively hot place like a desert, the last thing you want to do is shed the layers. Unless you're wearing wildly inappropriate and heavy clothing, a good garment will keep you cool. First and most obviously, clothes reduce the amount of direct sunlight hitting your skin, minimizing any overheating and potential sunburn. Second, as you get hot, you sweat and water leaves your body in an attempt to cool you down. Without clothes, it evaporates and leaves you dehydrated. With them, the sweat is trapped and creates a cool layer on your skin that also hydrates it slightly. Nice. People living in areas like the Middle East have worn long, light, flowing clothing for thousands of years for these exact reasons. These clothes are also traditionally white, the color that reflects the most sunlight. So there you go. 
They aren't just snazzy fashion statements and you're better off covering up than stripping off in the hot sun. In fact, you're better off covering up wherever you are. I don't want to see it. Sorry. Whiskey Warmth From partying to drowning your sorrows, there are lots of good and not so good reasons people drink alcohol. One good reason not to drink it, however, is to warm yourself up if you're dangerously cold. Yet people have believed it works for absolutely ages. St. Bernard dogs are often pictured with small barrels of meat around their neck for this very reason. Back in the 1800s, the heroic doggos would be sent out into snowstorms to rescue lost travelers and urban legends say they brought booze with them to warm the frozen people. Alcohol does create a warm feeling in the body, so it's somewhat understandable that this myth became so widespread. But what's really happening? Well, when you drink alcohol, it causes your blood vessels to dilate, which gives you that warm buzz as blood rushes to your skin. The problem is, in cold environments, your body's main defense is to push less blood to your skin and instead keep your core warm with it. So despite what it feels like, alcohol actually makes you colder. And that's not all. Booze also reduces shivering, another of your body's warming techniques. When you shiver, your muscles contract rapidly, creating energy that warms you up. Without this, you're gonna get colder faster. If that wasn't already enough reason to avoid a martini in a snowstorm, alcohol also causes you to sweat. Considering sweating is literally designed to cool you down, it's the last thing you wanna be doing if you're already freezing. So yeah, avoid the beer and concentrate on getting out of the cold as quickly as possible, then feel free to have a cocktail or three. Don't bring the heat. Right, so you're lost in the wilderness, but you've managed to stumble across a cave for shelter. Let's say that this cave isn't home to a hungry bear and is prime real estate to ensure your survival. Whatever you do, do not start a fire. You may have seen campfires and caves in every movie and TV show under the sun, but it can actually be an incredibly dangerous thing to do. Fire produces heat, duh, which is great for your chilly toes, but not so great for the cave. That's because heat causes rock to expand, so a fire could cause the rocks in the ceiling to change shape just enough that the structure becomes unstable. Causing a cave-in is hardly a useful survival technique. Even if your fire doesn't cause your cave to collapse, it'll soon fill up with smoke. An important outdoorsman tip known only to experts is that you need to breathe to stay alive. Polluting a confined space with smoke will make this super difficult. If you need a fire for any reason, your best bet is probably to start one just outside the cave. That way you avoid these dangers but still have your camp near shelter. Oh, and don't build that fire near anything dry or flammable either. Fire hot. Oh, fire dangerous. Tough guy tonic. If heaven forbid the worst happens and you find yourself wounded while out in the middle of nowhere, you've got to take care of it fast. In an ideal situation, rubbing alcohol or surgical spirit should be used to clean around a wound and prevent infection, but it shouldn't enter the wound itself. You probably won't have any of that though. So how about ordinary alcohol? In Hollywood, tough guy heroes will often pour whiskey into a recent wound to clean it. It looks badass, sure, but it's not a good idea in a real survival scenario. Strong drinking alcohol will disinfect a wound, but it's also likely to kill healthy cells and delay healing. And you'll want any wound to heal as quickly and smoothly as possible in an emergency where every second counts. Ideally, you want to apply pressure to the cut and use clean water to wash it with. If that's not possible, booze can be used, but only as a last resort. Seems like a waste of some perfectly good booze to me but sometimes sacrifices must be made. Camel logic. To drink or not to drink, that is the question. When stranded in a desert or any other hot location, water is a precious commodity. Do you drink that bottle in your backpack or do you save it for later? You probably think the sensible thing to do is to hold on to it and eke it out as much as possible. You'd actually be wrong. There's absolutely no reason to save water if you're lost in the wilderness. Wait, what? Hear me out. If you're thirsty, you need water. Extreme thirst can sap your strength and cognitive abilities, two things you'll need to use to stay alive. And the best place to store your water is in your body, not your backpack. 
It could give you the boost you need to find shelter, more water, or even rescue. So instead of rationing your water, concentrate on reducing your body's water loss. Avoid strenuous activity during the hardest part of the day, breathe through your nose rather than your mouth, and keep as much of your skin covered as possible. Be like a camel, move slowly, and store water in your home. Geronimo! Picture the scene. You're on an adventure trekking through foreign lands when suddenly a mighty beast jumps out of a patch of trees and starts coming at you. Naturally, you run away, as fast as you can. But what if you realize you're running straight towards the edge of a cliff? Jeepers. You've probably seen videos of daredevils or scenes in action movies of people leaping from incredible heights into water. They're always fine, right? So maybe you'd take the plunge rather than face the beast. I'm here to slap some sense into you. That is a terrible idea. After falling from a high place at high speed, the water surface may as well be concrete when you land. Jeez. Jumping from just 20 feet will cause you to slam into the water at around 25 miles per hour. At this speed, the water molecules at the surface won't be able to displace themselves fast enough to cushion you, causing the water to act more like a solid. Think about it. Normally, if you place your hand gently into water, there's barely any resistance. That's because the molecules have enough time to spread throughout the rest of the water, pushing minimal force back at you. The quicker you hit those molecules, however, the less time they have to move and the more resistance you're met with. That's why you could break bones from falling into water too fast. Cliff divers are specially trained to land in the water properly, and even then are often surrounded by medics or emergency personnel just in case something goes wrong. Even if you land in the water with the perfect form, the impact can still be strong enough to compress your spine. Ugh. Basically, don't jump off cliffs. It's probably a worse idea than facing whatever beastie may be after you. Shark bait. We've established jumping into water from up high isn't such a good idea, but sometimes the fall isn't the biggest danger. Sharks are the apex predators of the seas. Strong, fast, and with a mouth filled with razor-sharp teeth, they're capable of really ruining your day. But is there anything you can do if you find yourself on the wrong side of these ferocious fish? Well, many people reckon you can defend yourself from a shark attack by punching the predator in the nose. This sounds a lot easier than it is, though. If you're facing off against a shark, you're gonna be in water. Have you ever tried throwing a punch underwater? It's not easy. Water puts up so much resistance that you're highly unlikely to be able to put enough oomph behind a blow to do any damage. On top of that, you'd be placing your hand dangerously close to the shark's mouth. Remember those knife-like teeth? Yeah, you'd basically be giving the guy a free lunch. Want a better idea? Poke the predator in the eye instead. You don't need much force to damage such a sensitive area. If that fails, attack the gills. It's how the beast breathes, so digging your fingers in them will make things very uncomfortable for your attacker. And if you can try to use a weapon, anything you have to hand, a surfboard, a stick, whatever, it'll do more damage and minimize the risk of getting nibbled. That being said, these techniques should be last resorts. Sharks rarely attack humans and can usually be avoided or deterred. So if you spy one of these aquatic animals, your first move should be to swim calmly away. It's difficult for me because I look like such a snack, but if I can manage it, you can too. Moss Taken Nowadays, practically everybody has a GPS in their pocket in the form of a smartphone, but that wasn't always the case. Believe it or not, there was a time when humans had to actually use their wits to get from A to B. A persistent myth claims that if you end up lost in the woods, moss can be used as a sort of compass because it only grows on the north side of trees. So all you'd need to do to orient yourself is find a tree with some moss, check what side it's on, and bingo! Except, uh, that's a downright lie? Moss does mostly grow on the north-facing side of trees and rocks, but only in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, it grows on the south side more often. That's because those sides get the least sunlight, and it loves dark, damp places. Even so, it's never a guarantee that it'll grow on either side. It could grow anywhere, so don't rely on it to navigate, all right? Now, see if you can think of a witty moss pond to end this, because I'm stumped. Bare Knuckle Let's be honest, neither you nor I could take a bear in a fight. It doesn't matter how buff you are, and trust me, I'm buff. But the bear is buffer. 
and they're everywhere from Alaska to Norway, so you just might end up stumbling across one. If you do, you might have heard that playing dead is a surefire way to get rid of the burly beast. Nope, but it could be a surefire way to get you killed. Okay, sometimes playing dead is the right call, but it's entirely dependent on the type of bear that's hassling you. If you find yourself attacked by a black bear, don't even think about it. These guys are scavengers, so you'll just look like a free meal if you lay down. You'll want to calmly escape to a secure place if possible. If that's not possible, make yourself look as big as you can by puffing your chest out and holding your arms up in the air. The bear might overestimate you and leave. If it doesn't, you're gonna have to hit it, preferably on its face and muzzle. Make sure you don't try this on a grizzly though, they'll tear you to pieces. Indeed, if a grizzly <clears throat> bears down on you, then you should play possum. Lay flat on your stomach and place your hands behind your neck to cover it. After that, you've just gotta pray that that fierce furball loses interest. Not ideal, I know, but if you really want the best chance of surviving a bear attack, make sure you have bear pepper spray on hand. Or just stay out of bear territory altogether. You're unlikely to get a sing-song about the bear necessities out of them. Snow Benefit Water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. When dehydration sets in, you need to act fast. But if you're somewhere snowy, surely you could just eat the snow, right? After all, it's frozen water. Bingo. Well, that's exactly the problem. It's frozen water. The body needs to put in a heck of a lot of work in order to heat and melt that snow to make it usable. Organs wind up in overdrive and extra energy is used, leaving you more dehydrated than you were before. On top of that, ingesting a lot of freezing cold snow could easily lead to hypothermia if you're already cold. Not fun. Snow can be used to hydrate yourself, but you'd need to melt the snow first, then drink the water. Don't let your organs do all the work. They do so much for you already as it is. Oh, and one last thing. For Pete's sake, don't melt and drink yellow snow. Do I really need to say why? Venom Slurp Admit it, we all believed this next one at some point. If your pal is unfortunate enough to be bitten by a seriously venomous snake, you're supposed to suck the venom from the wound, right? Ha! I wouldn't recommend it. This myth has been propagated in books, movies, TV shows, Whatever the medium, somebody's chugged a snack venom smoothie out of someone else's bite. The reality is you'll never be able to suck out all the venom. You'll only end up adding bacteria from your mouth to the wound. On top of that, if you had any open wounds in your mouth or throat for the venom to enter, you'd wind up with some of it in your own bloodstream too. If either you or your pal do find yourselves full of serpentine nastiness, the best thing to do is head straight to a hospital. In the US, most snake anti-venom is universal, so you shouldn't have to waste time trying to snag a photo of the offending animal. Unfortunately, there's no crazy life hack that can help with a scenario like this. Your only option is to get that anti-venom administered as quickly as possible. If you do waste time trying to suck the venom out, well, somebody is likely to end up popping their clogs. So leave the straws at home, people. Forbidden Lemonade Let's say you've been separated from your mom at the mall. How long do you have? No food, no resources. At what point will you need to start drinking your own pee to survive? Okay, okay, you're probably not gonna be at the mall if you're seriously contemplating this. Let's say you're in the middle of the desert. The temptation would be there, I know, but I'm sorry to say drinking your own special brew will not hydrate you at all. Eh? But it's a liquid, right? Yeah, but think about it. If you're dehydrated, it means you don't have enough water in your system to begin with. So the vast majority of what comes out of Junior down there won't be water. It'll be waste products like toxins, pollutants, and salts. The very opposite of the things you want if you're dehydrated. And as your system battles with the toxic juice you just swallowed, you'll dehydrate even further. Strangely, survival <clears throat> experts like Bear Grylls have promoted riding the yellow wave for years. Well, guess what? It doesn't matter if you saw it on TV, it's a load of hooey. Anybody that's drank their own urine to survive and made it through did so in spite of drinking the smelly stuff, not because of it. If you really want to sample your own brand, organize a tasting session in the comfort of your own home, where you can have barf bags on standby. And on that disgusting note, that's all the survival myths I can tackle for one day. Which of these did you find the most surprising? Did you believe any of them yourself? Let me know down in the comments, and until next time, thanks for watching.